right. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the uh, UCLS for bringing me back for a second year. Uh, I am happy to be talking about all things drone data processing today. Um, I actually have, even though we have an hour and a half here, I've got a pretty packed schedule, so I'm going to actually go through things a little bit quickly. That said, I love questions. So if anyone has a question in anything that I'm talking about, please raise your hand or shout at me if I don't see it right away, and I'd be more than happy to uh, talk about that. That's, I like making these things a little bit interactive, especially because with the technology is new and as kind of fun as drones, there are a lot of misconceptions. So what I'm going to go over today is, first of all, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about current and new technology in drone survey. A lot of things that have kind of come out in the last year or two, how things are, how the drone industry is evolving as it applies specifically to land surveyors. Then I'm going to go through uh, a brief overview of what, like a, what a successful workflow looks like all the way from start to finish. Because that's what really this whole presentation is about. It's about the workflow side of things less than the kind of theoretical technology or anything. And then at the end, we'll go through a couple specialized and complex workflow options, ones that are, that'll won't apply to every single mission, but there are a lot of kind of specialized ones where you might want to pull out the drone where all of your standard workflows won't work. So we'll talk about that as well. I always like to say, to start out my presentations by saying what the goal of drone survey is. For us, we are a business, we work with businesses. We are not a research institution. And that means that there are three main goals of drone surveying to us. First, it should be better, better deliverables than uh, surveying on the ground. It should be faster, and it should be cheaper. To us, that is an absolutely necessary component of a successful drone surveying program. Otherwise, it's not a drone surveying program, it's a research project. And those are fine, but I have no interest in research projects. I want this to make business sense. Because at the end of the day, a drone survey should look like literally any other survey. There's sometimes imagery, sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's contours, sometimes there's not. There are annotations, there's a seal, and it gets done for the client what the client needs it to get done. It doesn't, a drone survey is not typically what a client requests. A client requests a survey. It's up to you, the surveyor, to pick the right tool for the job. So one thing that I'm gonna talk about a lot today, and especially like something that comes up in a lot of the Q&A parts, is can you do X, Y, Z? It's like, well, you could, but it's gonna take so much time and money that it doesn't really make sense. So I always say, your drone program isn't saving you time and money, then it just isn't working. And this presentation is about how to make sure that your drone program does save you time and money, that it does make everything that you do better, faster, and cheaper. That's the goal with all of this. A little bit about Aeritas. We do drone data processing for land surveyors. We've been doing it since 2014 which makes us uh, very young in the world of land surveying, but uh, pretty ancient in the world of drone technology, actually, which is kind of a fun place to be. Mm -hmm. And about me, I'm the CEO and actually lead photogrammetrist of Eritas. I started my first career in statistics, and then I've been in uh, photogrammetry and surveying since then, and I've got all my photogrammetry stuff, but blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, drone surveying journey. What a lot of people say, actually, by a show of hands, how many people are already flying drones in their company or have someone that they work with that are already flying drones? Awesome, most of you. I love crowds that actually most of you know what they're talking about. So you guys have probably seen a lot of this before. The drone surveying journey, many of you guys are already probably well into this. Everyone starts out, I get in a drone and I'll take basic photos and pictures, just pictures of a job site, documentation, something like that. Then they'll throw it at an online program and get ortho photos and say, ooh, now I've got a nice ortho photo, but Maybe it's not accurate, you're just using it to back up your, your maps. Then they start integrating uh, ground control, GPS, maybe some checkpoints to actually get high accuracy and high precision on those ortho photos as well. Okay, maybe now you can start getting a little bit more useful data out of, your, out of it. Then you start working in 3D data, surface models, point clouds. Now you're getting 3D polylines. Working those into clean CAD drawings as you're actually applying your layer templates, extracting curve lines, paint striping, utilities, Topo, creating clean contour lines, putting it all together in a final survey deliverable, and then the last, the end of the drone survey journey is when you actually start using it regularly. If you go all the way through this and forget that last step at the top, and you've only done it for a single project to prove that you can, that doesn't hit my criteria of saving you time and money. You actually have to start using this thing regularly in order to actually uh, 
make money off of the drone program. So with that, let's dive into the latest in drone technology, some of the latest trends that are coming out, things that people are talking about. First off, sensor options. The sensors have not changed too much in the last year. Um, more or less the same kind of three basic options. You've got your drone-specific cameras. These are the cameras that will come embedded in a uh, DJI Phantom 4 or um, uh, Inspire or M210 or the Autel drones. Those are far and away the most common because they are certainly the most reliable uh, options out there and they provide absolutely spectacular results with the right workflow. Large independent cameras, those are the big DSLRs that people strapped, strapped to the giant like multi-rotors. We're seeing a lot fewer of those actually in the last year as people are realizing that while they have better specs on paper, you know, more megapixels and whatnot, the complexity of that system leads to a lot of errors. It takes a real person that loves the troubleshooting technology to run them. So they still work, they still provide great data, but it's a highly complex workflow that people don't like. And then LiDAR. LiDAR is something that's really the hottest topic uh, when it comes to new sensors, new technology, and drones. Good LiDAR is really, really expensive. You're looking at $150,000 plus all in. Um, and honestly, I, I've got a couple more thoughts on LiDAR specifically. So first of all, over last year, we got the, the benefit of being able to see a handful of different uh, LiDAR data sets from numerous different platforms, systems, and applications. And honestly, the data quality is not something that we can knock at all. The data quality is pretty good if you spend enough money. If you're buying one of the cheap LiDAR systems, you might as well duct tape a laser pointer to one of your kids' toys and call it a LiDAR system. It does not get you survey grade data. Um, it gets pretty good, pretty good quality data, but it doesn't live up to all the hype that people want it to for, for how much money you're spending. They say, oh, LiDAR is great, it can penetrate vegetation. Well, yeah, that's true, but it's not 100%. Real dense vegetation, it's not going to do, it's not actually going to penetrate. Accuracy is typically two to three tenths in the real world after you factor in all of the various noise, GPS errors, vibration errors, IMU errors, all of these compounding errors put together. Uh, wind up being about two to three tenths of a foot error in our real world experience. Um, and also flight times are very short. You can't cover a huge amount of time with drone-based LiDAR. That said, like I said, the data quality is pretty good. Um, but the biggest problem with LiDAR right now uh, is that return on investment is nearly impossible at current prices. Um, if you can find a way to make good money on something with a $150,000 plus system, then by all means, but most of the LiDAR systems we see out in the field are kind of research units. People aren't actually using, aren't getting the ROI that they wanted out of them. So we process LiDAR data, but we don't see a lot of it because the costs just have to come down before it makes sense to start replacing field crews with, you know, that kind of crazy expensive specialized and not particularly reliable equipment. So that's what we've seen on LiDAR. There's a lot of technology working that in play right now that is promising to get those costs down in the coming couple of years. Um, but then again, that's what I heard a couple of years ago. So we'll see if it actually comes true. Fingers crossed, because it, it would actually be really great to get that kind of vegetation penetration, especially as something that photogrammetry simply can't do. As far as airframe options themselves, this also hasn't really changed that much. Um, small multi-rotors, like the DJI Phantom 4 series, unique, Autel has them as well. Large multi-rotors, more DJI stuff, micro drones ones. And then your fixed wings, SenseFly EV and Wingtra. Um, for those of you that have been in the uh, drone surveying world for long enough, you've seen all of these and know kind of the benefits and trade-offs. Smaller multi-rotors, you can get really, really great, great quality data, honestly. They are cheap, they are a good place to start, and you can actually get really, really good data with them. Large multi-rotors, if I'm being fully honest, are for people that want to show off their drones. Uh, you can also get very good data, but not that much better than uh, what you can get with like a Phantom 4 RTK. We love the Phantom 4 RTK, honestly. Um, and then the fixed wings and vertical takeoff, VTOL is vertical takeoff and landing. Fixed wings and VTOL ones, those are really going to be more for your really large sites, you know, 100, 200 acres plus regularly. If you're flying 200 acre sites a couple times a month, then yeah, fixed wings is going to be a more efficient solution for larger sites. For most other people, we like the multi rotors. Yeah? Fantastic question, and it's almost like you've seen my slide deck. Let's talk about RTK. 
So there are a couple of different uh, RTK options out there. So the, the FAM4 RTK and honestly a handful of other uh, competitors are starting to add onboard RTK antennas, which be, in this case they're going to be basically high accuracy dual band GNSS antennas onboard the aircraft itself with a handful of other software tweaks that allow the drone to get very, very precise positioning, per, positioning on the drone itself. Another question? So, Logan, when you're, when you're talking about RTK, is that a means by which to, and I'm sorry to interrupt you answering this, but is that so you don't have to use ground control? So, I'll get to that answer, but for a surveyor, you always need ground control. For a surveyor, you always, always, always need some amount of ground control. Uh, you need a lot less ground control, mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't even need to use it. You need to use it as check shot for, but to use something in land survey applications, doing it without ground control is fairly irresponsible and wouldn't really hold up to most uh, survey standards of care. So with RTK and PPK, the, uh, there are a couple different options of how you can actually process this workflow-wise. So the first one is with no RTK or no PPK, using just ground control points instead. That for the first couple of years of drone surveying was really the only option. It was the most affordable option out there. It still is the most affordable, affordable, simple, highly reliable, but it's a little lower accuracy and it takes a lot more field time to actually go out. You have to set a lot of those Jeep, uh, ground control points and you don't have that much redundancy in case you don't make one of your ground control points and blows away. With RTK, there are kind of three different workflow options. And I, I kind of have to speed through these simply because each one of these I could spend 20 minutes talking about the different nuances of how to work with them. The first is PPK, so post-processing all of that GPS data. That's really high accuracy where you're actually taking the, the, um, the raw satellite data off of the drone and you are post-processing it with a base station of your choice. You can use network corrections, you can use cores stations, you can use the, uh, the Utah State Network. You can even bring a third-party base station like at Leica or at Trimble or anything like that to your job site and use that to, uh, to PPK the corrections from the drone data. That's an extraordinarily reliable and highly accurate workflow, but it's time-consuming because it takes more processing time in the office. You actually have to run all of those corrections. So RTK is becoming much more popular, RTK being real-time kinematic. Uh, and there are two options there, one with a local base, uh, either made by DJI or there are ways to hack it so that you can get um, a Trimble or Leica base station streaming to the drone. It's a little trickier. Um, and then there is the system called Entrip, which is streaming over the internet network corrections to the drone itself. Um, they both lead to fairly comparable results. One requires a local base, the other requires an internet connection. In our experience, the accuracy is fairly comparable. You do get a little bit of accuracy degradation when you're working over network corrections, but it's not that meaningful in the, uh, given the other sources of error in the drone. The biggest problem, as we see it, is that uh, there, if there's, you require a cell phone connection and it's an error-prone workflow. And we say error-prone not in that, oh, using network corrections doesn't work, but if you were using network corrections on a uh, base on your GPS rover and you lose signal, then you just occupy the point for another second. But the drone can't do that because it's, it's moving 40 feet per second. So if it loses that internet connection even for a couple of seconds, you might have to refly the entire job site because it loses signal. So that causes a bunch of errors. You can't occupy the point for a long time. There are all kinds of other just workflow errors with the software that make it a pain. So ultimately, our recommendation is use a local base, um, either the one by DJI or a third-party base, Trimble Leica, and use those as the correction source for your, uh, for your RTK aircraft. Um, you can get very good data with the other workflows as well. That's just our preferred option. And honestly, that leads to what our overall recommended setup is for surveyors. The Phantom 4 RTK we think is the best, uh, best drone out there right now. Uh, we don't actually make money selling hardware, we make our money on data processing, so we can be a little bit more objective than a lot of people on what we really like. This really is the, uh, in our opinion, this is the best, uh, best surveying drone out there right now. Any other questions on the hardware before I move on? All right, next thing I want to talk about, just late news and drone technology, is the legal landscape, specifically remote ID. Now, if you haven't heard of remote ID, that's probably best because it doesn't actually matter that much for you, even though a lot of people online are making a whole stink about it. 
Remote ID is what the uh, FAA has just put forth. It's a whole new set of 500 pages of laws and regulations that are more or less a digital license plate for your drone that just gives a random number that then police and uh, you know first responders and stuff can look it up and find your, your information, see who's flying the drone and track you down if you're doing anything illegal. It will require additional hardware, but ultimately, if you have heard of it, great, this is our opinion for surveyors. No action on this law is gonna be required for four years, by which time the impact on surveyors will be minor. I mean, ultimately, the manufacturers will have to build new technology into their drones, which they will. Um, and other things, people think, oh, I need an internet connection. No, you don't. This is different from ADSB. So like I said, if, if you haven't heard about remote ID, pay no attention to me. Uh, if you have heard about it, it's not something you need to worry about from a surveyor's perspective. Um, if, however, you are a hobbyist aircraft flyer or a hobbyist uh, drone pilot, that's where remote ID is going to be a huge pain. Um, I don't want to go into that right now, but that's why people are freaking out on the internet about it, because this, is, this law is going to really clamp down on the ability for people to fly just for fun. But for commercial users and for people using drones for surveying, you'll have almost no impact. All right, so you guys didn't come here to talk about the, uh, the laws. We want to talk about the actual workflow and how you can use a drone and get good data out of your uh, good, valuable data at reasonable prices for a good amount of time. So what the basic workflow looks like, this is kind of the high-level workflow as it will look like for pretty much every survey op drone survey operation. You start with mission planning. That's just putting together everything that you want to do. Where am I going to fly? How high am I going to fly? What drone am I going to use? How many ground control points should I set, etc. Data collection. You go out, you fly the drone, you gather your shots in the field, you come back. Stitching it together, there are a couple of different steps. First is photogrammetry, uh, which is putting the photos together into a 3D model. Line work is then extracting your topo points, freight lines, tin surface, planimetrics, utilities, paint lines, blah, blah, blah. And then in CAD, you go ahead and put everything back together. So now this is a drone data processing uh, talk right now, and that's a, what we do as a company. But I'm actually going to spend a lot of time talking about mission planning first. So what is mission planning? Like I said, that is asking first, is this a good site for drone photogrammetry? Asking things like, is it legal to fly here? Am I right in the flight path of Salt Lake City Airport or not? What altitude should I fly? What's the appropriate overlap? and on and on and on. Questions like this. So why should you care about mission planning? Why should you start by saying, why should you start with five, ten minutes in the office before anything, uh, anyone goes out in the field by asking these questions? Well, first of all, it will save you a lot of field time, which is just kind of nice. Part of that good, uh, good program should save you time. If you do your mission planning right, you set fewer ground control points. You need to do less ground surveying because you know what you can get out of the air. Your flight times will actually be shorter when you plan them well, and you don't have, you won't need to uh, revisit this field at all because you will get all the data you need the first time. But that's not it. You also actually save a lot of office time as well. Shorter processing times, better accuracy, fewer photogrammetry errors, and a simpler drafting workflow are all results that come from good mission planning. In fact, as a data processing company, we found that about two thirds of our photogrammetry errors, the photogrammetry problems that we see, are caused by bad mission planning. It's not, oh, this is a challenging site or something unexpected <laughs> happened. It's mostly bad mission planning. So the first step of good mission planning, and th that's why I spent so much time talking about this. Most of the time, when people ask me to like troubleshoot a photogrammetry project or say I'm killing myself for the time that I'm spending, it's because because mission planning was just somehow wrong. They collected too much data. So I always say the first thing is to, to ask if it's a good project for drone photogrammetry at all. Good projects, typically in the range of half an acre to 500 acres, smaller than that, shoot it on the ground, bigger than that, look at a uh, traditional fixed linear aerial mapping company. Up to about 20 miles, maybe 30 miles in linear assets, low to moderate vegetation, things like ALTA surveys, topo data, most planimetrics, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas bad projects, where you might want to consider using a different tool, are very, very large projects. More than 500 acres, more than 100,000 photos. It's going to take you an awful long time to, uh, to process, and you're going to struggle with it. Things with really dense vegetation and tree cover. If it's totally forested over, over 80, 90% of the site, maybe not the right tool for the job. 
Extremely high accuracy tolerances. When you need better than a tenth of a foot accuracy, and you need to certify it. Things like if you're doing all ADA wheelchair ramps, those are going to require better than a tenth of a foot accuracy. Probably need to break out a total station for that as opposed to relying on a drone. But for paint striping, that obviously can be done on a drone. Indoor data underneath overhangs. Yes, you can fly a drone indoors. No, you cannot reasonably map a drone indoors. I could very easily, you know, take off any DJI Phantom in this room, but the amount of work it would take to generate any sort of usable photogrammetry information would be overwhelming. Not technically impossible, but an overwhelming amount of work. Um, same thing goes with underneath trees. Yeah, you can fly a drone underneath trees, but you can't reasonably get data from there. And I'm going to stress that again because it, it kind of matches up with a lot of what I've uh, been trying to say is that, yes, you can get data with the drone indoors, and you can fly a drone underneath trees, but there is no reasonable workflow by which a drone will save you time compared to actual surveying on the ground if you're trying to do underneath trees or indoors. There are different tools that are better suited for those types of jobs. Drones are very, very good at these projects over here where there's you know at half an acre up to 500 acres, moderate vegetation, that sort of thing. The next thing we say about mission planning, and the place where uh, people kill themselves on the data processing as well, is knowing your desired outputs. The biggest time killer we see is, well, let's just see what we can get out of it. When people fly the drone for a project site, and they're like, well, we just want to see what we can get out of the drone. Well, you can get an awful lot of things out of the drone. You can count the number of leaves on a tree if you want to. And that's going to take an awful lot of time to start counting leaves on a tree. So I always like to say, can you imagine, let's just send a crew out to a job site with some tools and see what they come back with? It's not going to end up too well for you. So once you, to know your desired outputs in advance will really help you streamline your drone program and make it much more efficient. And then start with your requirements as well. There is a direct trade-off between flight altitude and your expected accuracy. This table up here is uh, more or less calibrated to a DJI Phantom 4 Pro, um, the non-RTK version. And these accuracies are actually a little bit uh, conservative. We typically see better accuracies than that if the rest of the workflow is tight. But the biggest thing that, there, that you see um, uh, from this table is that when you're flying low, 100 feet, you actually can cover not a huge amount of area, about five acres per battery, but yeah, you get good accuracy. When you fly a lot higher, you can uh, cover a lot more land, 10 times as much uh, area in the same amount of time, and a little bit lower accuracy. Now, if you're doing one foot contours, the answer should be obvious, yeah, fly higher. But if you are doing an ALTA and you need tight tolerances, on hardscape, if you need really clean curved lines, curve and gutter, then you're going to want to fly lower. So know your accuracy requirements in advance helps. A couple of flight pan best practices, just kind of things that we've learned as uh, a general rule of thumb, which I will then break all of these when we get to the end of the presentation with our kind of complex workflows. But general rule of thumb is going to be a lawnmower, lawnmower flight path. And that's going to be this single back and forth flight path. Um, there are a lot of apps out there that will recommend what we call cross-hatch pattern, double cross-hatch pattern. That's typically uh, data overkill, and we've done a lot of testing that shows that that does not dramatically improve the quality, quality of your data. Same thing, 75-75 overlap, that's a very good middle ground for about 90% of projects. That's going to get you the highest quality data without uh, making your processing times too long. And also meteor-only photos. That means photos pointing straight down. Uh, no oblique photos where the camera's tilted at all. Once again, that actually adds a lot of noise and error to the processing and time to the processing without a huge increase in accuracy or any increase in accuracy, really. Yeah? Does the software tell you if you're getting a like your pre-planning, does it tell you if you're getting a 75% overlap? Yeah. Yeah, that's all based all of the over all of the autopilots nowadays. You set your overlap in advance. You don't actually fly the drone manually. You just kind of draw a polygon where you want to go, set your flight altitude, and say 75, 75 overlap, and then you push go. And things fly themselves. So with flight planning, and especially as it plays into the data processing side of things, there is such a thing as too much data. Too many photos 
Too many angles, trying to fly really, really low will cause more problems. It does cause more time in the field, but it cause, causes longer processing times, huge files, big data problems, and possible erroneous matches. So in general, where you can, it actually does help a lot to fly higher, fly a lawnmower pattern, not crosshatch, and no overlap overkill, cranking it up to 90-90 overlap is not going to improve the quality of the data, and it also won't make up for other mistakes that you might make in mission planning. If you don't set any control, flying a higher overlap is not going to fix the fact that you have no ground control. That's not, that's just not how it works. All right, so the next thing that is also relevant in, uh, in data processing is planning for ground control points and, che and uh, checkpoints. So, in general, ground control point best practices, we recommend five targets per battery in regular rectangular sites, put them in the corner, one in the middle, fly one flight line beyond each side of the, uh, of the ground control points with an obvious center point and something that's visible from all angles. Pretty straightforward. The other thing is that your accuracy uh, specifications determine how much ground control you need. The tighter accuracy you need and the lower that you are flying, the more ground control you need. So going back to this kind of table we were talking about earlier, if you're flying at 100 feet, you need five targets every five acres, or one target per acre. If you were flying at 400 feet, you need five targets per 50 acres. So that actually means you would need to set 10 times as many ground control points for a project to fly at 100 feet as you would at 400 feet. And this goes back to that saving time in the field and actually making this drone program work for you. You can fly a 50-acre site at 100 feet, and you're going to be setting 50 ground control points, which takes a lot of time. And you know, maybe that makes sense on some project sites, but it's important to know those trade-offs going in. Now, these amount of ground control points, that's what we recommend for non-RTK data, but that's really been changing this last year or two years about now with the, uh, with the adoption of the Phantom 4 RTK. So, adding onboard RTK dramatically reduces the need for control and checkpoints, but control and check data is still required for ASBRS certification and for actual any, any definition of survey grade accuracy that you want. You're going to need at least a couple of checkpoints on the ground. One of the biggest errors that we see is when people just trust this and then there are all sorts of vertical data and translation issues, uh, especially. DJI software is obnoxiously horrible at managing data translations appropriately, and we very regularly just see shifts when people plan it wrong. A lot of sites obviously aren't going to be perfect WGS84 or perfect NAT83, so you're going to need to localize them to the site, and you can't do that automatically. In fact, to localize a project to the site, you need your ground control, and you can shift and adjust your project to actually get it to the same coordinate system as all of the historical data and all of the ground and underground data and boundary data that you have. And if you do this right, where you have your ground control, and even if it's just a couple of checkpoints translate your data, then all of it will work together seamlessly. If your ground control is in the right coordinate system, then when you tie everything together, when you import your drone data into your existing drawing files, it will all match up, or rather it should all line up automatically without any need to fiddle with anything there, or worry about exactly what data you did. Tie the project to the ground control, that really, really helps. So how many ground control points is enough for RTK data? No control is not good enough. There is one slight caveat to that, which is if you are doing volumetrics only, if all you care about is how many cubic yards of dirt are in that pile, then you can get away with no ground control. But as surveyors, you typically have a much higher standard for accuracy, for repeatability than that. That's where a lot of the marketing in the drone, like RTK world, has been like, oh, get your good accuracy with no ground control. Yeah, with volumetrics, the, uh, the RTK on board the drone is, is very precise, which means its relative locations are really tight, but it's quite inaccurate in our testing by up to a couple of feet. The whole project can shift by up to a couple of feet, we've seen, and that's, uh, that's obviously very problematic. So that's why you need at least some control to localize your project and detect other major errors. Bare minimum is uh, one control point per project, and you can use that to check. But uh, good practice is probably to have three. Every time you move the base station, you want to have another three uh, ground control points. 
maybe three per 50 acre area or three per linear mile if you're doing that irrigation plan. So that's with RTK. Um, and next, I'll go pretty quickly through field data collection as well. Uh, start by just collecting all the data that the drone can't. There's no uh, tool for this. You guys are surveyors, you know how to do it. Boundaries, building corners, monuments, ADA areas, obscured areas under trees, and your high accuracy points. Next up is uh, marking the ground control points. Um, these are just a couple examples of what we consider to be less than ideal ground control points. So all white kind of gets washed out. Corner of visual ID points are really hard for a photogrammetrist because they might wind up marking that one instead, shifting the whole project by a couple of feet. Chevrons are always a little tricky because some surveyors mark the outer tip, some surveyors mark the inner corner, some surveyors like to mark uh, actually a point in between those. And the only thing that we've found consistent about chevrons is that every single surveyor thinks the way that they mark them is the way that everyone else ought to be marking them too. Um, and then of course my last and most favorite one that I've shown before is that we've actually seen that in projects. That just, if you use that as a target, Keep doing it, that's just awesome. <laughs> uh, but if not, um, we recommend basic cross-hatch patterns, shameless plug, we actually sell biodegradable uh, ground control points as well that you can then leave in the field when for remote sites that are highly visible. So those ones are pretty nice. As far as how to fly the drone for drone surveying, this one's pretty easy. You click the takeoff button. Anyone that's flown a drone, I'm not going to spend any time at all on flying it. The drones fly themselves at this point. Um, there's some safety procedures to be aware of, but realistically, there's no skill needed in flying a drone. Lastly, have a field operations workflow. Everything from safety, checking for site restrictions, weather forecast, creating your flight plans once you've planned it all, surveying your data, load mission, click go, and then you're done. These, uh, checklist, these operations workflows will just help create a more reliable um, overall drone program. We recommend checklists. Um, this is what our checklists look like. I have a whole bunch of these at our booth if you want them. We recommend to just keep it in the case with the drone. Simpler is better because it will get people to actually use them. If you try and give someone a 15 page checklist, they'll never use it. But uh, make it easy to just kind of look through and help remind you of the little things that are super easy to forget that can wind up stealing a couple hours of your life, which is no fun at all. Okay, now let's get to the meat of things, the office workflow. Photogrammetry, line work drafting, and CAD finishing. These are kind of in additional steps of complexity. So photogrammetry is this part that gets you your photos and videos, your ortho photos, and your high accuracy data. Line work drafting is when you start extracting it to get your 3D data out of those point crowds, getting the CAD drawings. And how you work it into CAD then and into your existing workflow is really the, uh, the critical part of getting those final survey deliverables and using this system more regularly. So photogrammetry is the process of stitching photos into the interim files. Pix40 is the most common software here, and the typical outputs of the photogrammetry process are going to be a point cloud, Ortho photo, digital surface model. Those are the most common ones. There are others, but these are the three that everyone uses. Then you need to reduce that rich model, that rich 3D model that has every single leaf on the tree, into a CAD friendly surface. Because photogrammetry outputs are too big for CAD and not particularly usable. Anyone that's ever opened a 10 gigabyte point cloud file knows that that is not what anyone actually cares about. You have to turn that data into something useful. That's the uh, line work process. And then finishing it in CAD is merging in all your field shots, adding culture, applying your layer templates to make the finished survey look indistinguishable. So to summarize, you start with your, this is what the, a good processing workflow ought to look like. You start with your photos, ground control, and RTK, PPK data, goes through the photogrammetry process, which creates ortho photos, DSMs, and point clouds. Then it ought to go through a line work drafting process, which will get you 3D points, polylines, typically in a DXF format, go through your CAD finishing process to get typically a DWG drawing file, add it in your site culture, contour, surface, and that will get you your final deliverable. So getting into the details of all of this now. Photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is the art and science of making measurements from photographs. 
The technology itself has been around for a hundred some odd years. The technology is really sound. There's nothing new or fancy about it. What's new and fancy about it is we now, <coughs> excuse me, we now have the ability to use drones to take a thousand photos within just a couple hours. And we also have computers that can process those thousand photos and make a couple hundred million measurements all at once. But it's the same core technology that's been around for a very long time. And the output of this is a rich 3D model. Now a rich 3D model has its own problems. This is what the raw outputs often look like, with contours drawn around, equipment, and tractors, and cars, and jaggedy stuff, and rocks. If there are trees and vegetation, all of that is included in the rich 3D model too. And that's one of the biggest time killers is getting rid of that. But we'll talk about that in the line work drafting <laughs> stage. Now, it's worth noting that photogrammetry takes time. There's no way around this. It takes a little bit of human time, not a lot. You gotta mark your ground control points, and then you throw it at the software with a big mate with a big server, and you wait. And it takes a lot of computer time. There is no magic bullet to that. There are ways that you can reduce the amount of computer time, like good mission planning and fewer photos and not going crazy with overlap. But still, fixing the error and just experimenting takes hours and hours. Anyone that has used Pix4D has, no, has seen that before. When you let something process overnight, it takes 12, 24 some hours, sometimes longer, only to find that the processing failed for not necessarily a clear reason. And improved hardware only does so much. You can spend $20,000 on a computer, and it will only get you 20% faster processing time than a $5,000 computer. Which, while yeah, 20% faster is great, it still means overnight processing for a lot of projects. So, improved hardware is not going to fix problems that have that come up earlier, like bad ground control placement and being able to spot things or spot errors uh, before in the photogrammetry step. And while we're on photogrammetry, one of the things that I like to put up is the worst idea is to ask for the best accuracy possible. Now that might sound a little counterintuitive, right? We want the best accuracy possible. Heck, that's something that we hear all the time. Well, if you want the best accuracy possible, then I'll tell you what we need to do. <clears throat> Buy a $100,000 drone and camera setup, fly it 50 feet above ground, you're gonna take 10,000 photos for a 10 acre site, I want 5,000 control shots that are all shot with a total station, and it'll take two to three months to process it, and we'll charge you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for it. That's how you get the best accuracy possible. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Know your accuracy, know your requirements in advance before getting into photogrammetry, because if you start going down that rabbit hole, you are going to spend insane amounts of money for accuracy differentials that don't matter. You will get your accuracy from a tenth of a foot vertical to nine or eight hundredths of a foot vertical, and you will absolutely ruin your drone program and possibly lose your job in the process. So get rid of that concept of the best accuracy possible. The, this is about a business where you have to manage the right balance between accuracy and getting the job done. Save time, save money, get better deliverables, that's how it works. Other things in photogrammetry that make sense as part of like our, our principles for the photogrammetric process is it's better to work smarter, not harder. The photogrammetry process is not one where there's some magical fixed number of settings that can make every single job process fine. Every job is unique. Every job has its own challenges. We'll go through a couple of them later. <coughs> But going through an iterative process where you actually go through QA, you run a sparse point cloud, you integrate your GCPs, you reprocess it, run more QA, make a point cloud, run more QA, and then make these tweaks to iterate on every single project will actually save you time and get you better accuracy in the long run. Also, we recommend having a human in the loop uh, at every single process. For surveyors, again, and a lot of this is all caveated for surveyors and engineers, which is all we work with. Uh, automated black box solutions do not produce the accuracy that surveyors require. At least if you're doing topo, if you're putting your seal on a project, automated black box solutions are just not reliable enough. They can't spot errors as they come up. There are a lot of uh, errors there. <laughs> so another thing on the uh, workflow, people say, oh, well, you guys do tons of photogrammetry. Yes, we do a lot. Do you have some magical computer power? No, not really. In fact, this is our most recent generation of uh, of processing servers. This is what the hardware is in our server stacks. 
For anyone that has built computers and stuff knows, okay, this is a really high-end gaming computer, but it's not like some magical thing. What makes us what makes us different? Why we can actually do a lot of these projects and you know manage hundreds of thousands of photos is that we have well, one, we have lots of these, but uh, two, we also know how to use them in a smart and repeatable manner. Because ultimately, using photogrammetry software correctly, it's about it's not about the settings; it's about the workflow. Having that standardized workflow, using checkpoints, constantly checking for errors—that's an important part. Adjusting your settings based on the site and getting trained in photogrammetry. These are some of the, the steps to a repeatable workflow that will make something more, that will make your photogrammetry workflow a lot more reliable. And part of it is we say fixing a problem takes three steps. First, you have to realize there's a problem. This is the biggest issue with black box software as we see it. They will process your photos and spin them out without ever realizing there's a problem, even if there is one. And problems aren't always your fault. Annoying real world things happen. Kids walk by and kick ground control points or kick your total station. A battery dies. You lose internet connection mid flight. You know, you know, on a particularly cold day, the camera might come ever so slightly out of calibration. The sunlight changes from overcast to sunny in the middle of a project. There are lots of things that cause little solvable problems. Those problems are all solvable by good uh, data processing. But you have to realize there's a problem first. And uh, there are a couple of ways to, to realize there's a problem. But even once you realize there's a problem, you have to be able to figure out what caused that problem too. And then you need to fix that cause or learn to avoid it next time. First way to do that is obviously with a quality report that most photogrammetry software spits out. But uh, know the limitations here. Just because everything is green on the quality report, again, this is kind of that black box solution, doesn't mean all of your data is good. In fact, it can often be a little bit misleading. For those that know Pix4D quality report, this is kind of one of the things that comes at the top of these five general uh, line items of how many key points there are, did your photos calibrate, and then if you have GCPs, it gives you an RMS error up here of the ground control points, and the quality report here indicated an accuracy of three thousandths of a survey foot. That is not a real accuracy number, it's kind of misleading because it's measuring the ground control points to themselves. In fact, to actually accurately measure error, you want to use checkpoints. Independent checkpoints, they should be measured independently, they should not be used in the photogrammetry process, and if reasonable, they should be evenly distributed throughout the job site. And the last way to actually be able to like integrate into your data processing workflow a lot of this is to actually get trained on photogrammetry. We recommend the ASPRS, the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. It was founded in 1934. It's a nonprofit organization. We have no formal affiliation with them. We just uh, think that, honestly, they're a really great organization if you want to actually learn the science of photogrammetry. And then the last thing in the photogrammetry step, in at least the standard photogrammetry workflow, is always is managing processing time. This is where most people kill themselves with photogrammetry step. It's not that they don't know how to do it. It's not that you don't know how to mark ground control points. Clicking the center of a target is not friggin' hard. Uh, it's that they don't know how to manage the processing time properly. Now a lot of this is decided in the field by, by mission planning. In fact, I'd probably say over half of the, uh, of the processing time impact is made with that initial mission planning step. Because people have a tendency to collect more data thinking it's always going to be better. But overlap, overkill, flying too low, unnecessary cross-edge patterns will all add enormously to processing time. And it's non-linear. If you double the photos, it typically creates about four times the processing time in, uh, in PIX4D. So we say a good workflow that uses an iterative process and good mission planning is going to be worth a lot more than a new computer or a new drone or anything like that. Good field workflow, good office workflow, and then staging your processing, run, run step one, run rapid processing first, and integrate things, check QA, QC for errors, and then move on from there. So photogrammetry is a little tricky, or of course, another minor shameless plug, just have us do the hard work, because we offer those services too. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's one of the principles of our company. We try not to hide the ball with what we do. We're, we're not black magic wizards about photogrammetry. We're not the only people that know how to fly a drone and turn it into 
3D data, but we know the workflows and we know the efficient processes and the training to make sure that we can do it really accurately and really fast without spending a lot of time working on it. That's what we do. So next up, line work drafting. What's line work drafting? Well, it is reducing the uh, rich model to a CAD-friendly surface, like I said before, because photogrammetry outputs are too big for CAD, and reducing it all to CAD compatibility. Why is it necessary the files are too big? For anyone that has tried to open a you know, 5 plus gigabyte file in Civil 3D and watch their computer give up, just put out clouds of smoke and then start crying and then run away in tears. Uh, yeah, Civil 3D, 3D does not like big files. It has too much data that you don't need and not enough data that you do need because it has ugly data and contours and artifacts. The lakes will look all jaggedy. Anything like fresh and clean asphalt will have spikes or pits in it or anything like that. Those, space, those are all challenges with the automated contour. Now that said, there are a number of different methods for line work drafting here. And so I'll start with what I call the OK methods. And I say OK because really there's no perfect method to line work drafting. There are a handful that all work. The first is to draft on, draft on individual photos. This would be if you were trying to, do, to extract data directly from PIX4D, where you kind of pick the same point from multiple photos. It's how old school stereo photogrammetry was done if you're using a big stereo plotter. You're actually drafting on the individual photos. This gets you really high accuracy data, but it's ridiculously time consuming and should only be used for a handful of points per project, if that. The other option is, direct, is drafting directly on the ortho photo via um, a GIS application, ArcGIS or something along those lines that can handle a full resolution ortho photo. That gets you pretty good 2D data, but obviously it's lacking 3D data in terms of polylines, contour lines, that sort of thing. Point cloud drafting is another one where you actually open up a full scale, a full resolution point cloud in a point cloud software. You can apply some custom point cloud filtering methods to that. Topo Dot is a common one that can do this, or AutoCAD Revit can do point cloud drafting as well. There are numerous solutions out there. Uh, point cloud drafting uh, is another one that gets high quality data, but is typically pretty darn time consuming. Another common one is drafting on the DSM and ortho photo, where you can actually open the DSM and ortho photo combined to extract topo data. So those are all okay methods and a good workflow should actually be familiar with all of them so that you can pull out the right tool for the job. Having access to software that's capable of each one of these methods can really help make a drone program successful overall because you can pull really hard points out based off the individual photos. You can pull 2D data out directly from the ortho photo and topo data that you can come from the point cloud. You mix those all together and having a, a drafter that has the eye to know which data to pull out which software is really the, uh, the way to get this data most efficiently. Now I say those are the okay methods, but there are some bad methods as well too. The first one that I say is people that import the ortho photo into Civil 3D. Not only is that really kind of technologically challenging, but the real danger that we often see is what people import into Civil 3D, they wind up downsampling the image aggressively so that Civil 3D can actually handle it. Either breaking it up into a million tiles or reducing the resolution. That's fine if all you want to do is give context to the site, but if you're actually drafting on the photos, you don't want to, you don't want to reduce the quality of your data. You spent all this time setting your control and flying at the right altitude to get good quality data, and then you throw it away in order to just be able to use it in your software. It's really a waste of the time that you've already spent. The same thing goes with what we call dumb decimation of a point cloud. That's when people say, this point cloud's too big and I'm having trouble working with it, I'm just going to uh, delete 90% of the points. Once again, you're reducing a lot of the actual resolution of your data. Um, there's, tech, there's technology that's getting smarter with point cloud decimation where it's reducing the sizes without reducing critical points, but we've had very mixed results with those so far. So dumb decimation of a point cloud is definitely not something that we recommend right now. But with all of these other ones, being able to pick between which of those uh, workflows will actually get the most valuable data is going to be a really effective way of extracting data. As for what software do we actually use to uh, draft this, we use all kinds of different softwares. This is another one where there's no magic bullet. It's looking at these different things, 
saying, okay, what data do I need, and then pulling the right tool out of your toolbox for it. Ultimately, line work drafting, if you were coming here for me to show you some sort of software that you could click a button and give you a sales pitch like, ooh, look, now you get all of your points in your exact tab, like layer template, and it's perfect. There's, there's no specific, amazing, perfect fix for that either. Line work drafting takes a lot of time. And it's different from photogrammetry, because it only takes a little bit of computer time. But it takes a ton of human time. A lot more human time. It is tedious. It is very tedious when you are reducing errors, when you are drawing curved lines, when you are cleaning artifacts off of asphalt and flattening the lakes so that they uh, go through, so that they look nice in a uh, topo drawing. They require good QA, QC when you draft this. I don't care what software you use too. There are lots of softwares out there that promise magical auto drafting things. They spend all of, you'll spend all of your time in the QA, QC step fixing all of the things that those softwares have badly identified. There are no magic solutions, or you could just have us do the work again. Okay, <laughs> on to cat finishing. The last step, uh, and then we'll get into some of the more complex workflows. Cat finishing is then the process of turning all of that process, once you extract your data, into a final survey like this. First step is basically to merge your field shots and your drone data together. Drone data is really great for topo points, brake lines, paint striping, edge of pavement, curbs, as well as things like utilities, lamp poles, power poles, fencing, walls, retaining walls, yada, yada, yada. Your field data is typically going to be things like boundaries, building corners, monuments, ADA compliant uh, ramps, and obscured areas, as well as uh, underground utilities, anything that might be on a right of way that you actually can't measure from the air. So you merge all of that together in a single into a single CAD file, and from there, it's honestly pretty, pretty simple stuff for any, anyone that uh, works regularly in CAD. You create your, your tin surface, you draw contours on top of that surface, you apply your layer templates, you apply colors to the whole thing, improve visibility and usability, making sure that your scaling is right, making sure that you have symbols located in the right way. And then the, the last step is adding in CAD-friendly imagery. Now this is something that uh, we've done a lot of work on. CAD-friendly imagery is <coughs> is imagery that is designed, as the name would imply, to actually work in CAD. <coughs> I promise I don't have coronavirus, don't worry. Uh, so, to work properly in CAD, it needs to be less than 200 megabytes, typically, using good compression algorithms, and one that's op optimized for context and printing. For example, if you look at this site right here, you can very clearly see what you are looking at. Because, what, but once you zoom in, you'll notice you do lose resolution. You can't see the sharp edges of the curve. You can't read what's on a manhole when you're at this level. But being able to have the algorithms to quickly create those CAD-friendly images, geo-reference them, get them into your CAD file so that anyone who then sees that CAD file knows what's there, that will really help uh, improve the quality of your deliverables. So again, they just kind of look like a final survey that looks the same whether it's been made conventionally or with the drone. All right, moving on. Two, specialized workflows. So now, what, everything I just went through, that's what, a, what we consider a standard, highly efficient, good workflow looks like. You put all of those pieces together and you will create drone, program, drone projects in no time that will save you time, save you money, and literally everyone will start wanting you to use the drone on more projects. That means your field crew, because they're saving a huge amount of time, your data crew because they have cleaner, easier, more complete data to work with, and your clients because they have better quality data, they have imagery with all of their maps. Honestly, a good drone program makes everyone along the value chain uh, better. But specialized workflows gets a little weird. It's something that we hear very, very often is when people come to us and say, I've got a weird project. It's different because I need to do X, Y, Z. I need something with a lot of vegetation. I'm flying close to an airport. I'm flying a really unique one where there are trees and I need under an overcast and blah, blah, blah. And there are answers to most of these questions. I alluded to this earlier when I said, you know, oh, you could use a drone to get a map of this room, but maybe you shouldn't. And so when I talk, when I'm going to talk about specialized workflows, what I really want to
want to start with is, is a quote that I really like. Um, it wasn't designed around surveying. It's by Elon Musk, who said that one of the biggest traps for smart engineers is optimizing a thing that shouldn't exist. Now, when it comes to surveying and the application there, a lot of really smart surveyors and smart people will kill themselves over creating this highly complex, advanced, nuanced, crazy workflow to use a drone for a project that has absolutely no business being flown by a drone. Where either instead of a drone, I mean, there's one test that I like to use for this, I call it the camera on a stick test. Can you replace the drone with a camera on a stick? And if the answer is yes, then you shouldn't be flying a drone. We're talking about mapping this room with a drone, that's a terrible idea when I can put a GoPro on a stick and get a much better map without all of the problems and complications that come with flying a drone inside. So don't optimize this. And my uh, second quote is, don't build a workflow that shouldn't exist by my uh, most favorite author. That's, that's me. So uh, here's some examples of different advanced things that we would consider more advanced, more complex workflows. Uh, that I'll go through uh, a couple of these uh, before we let everyone go. The first off, first one is uh, all of the different airborne RTK workflows. And again, each one of these is really worth it, its own, you know, blog post or article, and we have not a number of them published on our website as articles. Uh, but how to use RTK with the DJI base station? Why? Why and where that is more beneficial than bringing out uh, a Leica base station? Why, where, why and where that will save time? Do you want to bring two base stations to a site where you have your Leica base and then you have your DJI base station too? The answer is sometimes yes. Uh, why do you want PB? When do you want PBK? How do you PBK process things? Well, that depends a lot on the network that you're using. When you're doing RTK with network corrections, okay, great. You don't need to bring any base station to the site, but you internet connection. How's that going to work? How do you solve those problems? And then RTK with a third-party base station. How do you get the DJI Phantom 4 to talk to your R10 or your GS18 or whatever? Next up is long corridor emissions. That's one that I actually will talk about in a little bit. Are some of the different complexities that come if you are surveying a five-mile stretch of highway or a pipeline or a power line corridor. So we'll talk about that in a second. Certifying accuracy is another advantage. So we talked a little bit about accuracy and uh, the expectations that you can have from accuracy. Um, but we haven't talked about certifying it yet. Not all projects require the aerial data to be certified, but we've done a handful of projects that do. So how do you do that? Um, there's a document called the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards that anyone that's heard me before has probably heard me talk about those. They're really valuable in how to certify accuracy. Photogrammetry troubleshooting. I have one. I have three ground control points that are showing five tenths of a foot air. What do I do? When to use oblique imagery? There are a couple of uh, of situations. I said before, don't use oblique imagery, but there are a couple of situations where oblique imagery can actually help. Notably, when you are surveying the facade of something. For example, if you were doing a building and you needed accurate data on the facade of the building itself which most surveyors rarely need to do work actually on the facade of the building. But if you did, that's when uh, working in oblique imagery might actually help. And the question then becomes, okay, well, what angle of oblique imagery? How far away from the building? How many photos should I take and from what location, what elevation, what angle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you are forced to fly low, this is always a fun one, when people are flying in FAA restricted airspace and they only get authorization to fly up to 100 feet, how do you deal with it? That's always a uh, kind of fun advanced workflow to talk about. Flying in FAA restricted airspace when you do have a lot of aircraft, other aircraft around. Flying in DJI restricted airspace. I'll talk about the difference between those in a second. Um, because DJI and the FAA have their own restrictions that don't entirely overlap, which is always nice of them to just complicate things. Managing very large projects throws its own uh, issues when you do have 10,000. 100,000 photos or more. Those are very large projects. How do you manage those in terms of data processing? Managing sites with significant elevation change as well. Uh, dealing with significant vegetation, there are a few things you can do, and sites with restricted access if you can't get on the ground and set some ground control points. 
So uh, we we'll might have a couple minutes left over, and I'd love to take some questions on these, because I know these are where a lot of people have questions on specific project sites. I'm happy to say there are answers to all of these things, and unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for your guys' sake, I was not given an eight-hour slot where we can actually go through examples of every single one. Um, but there are solutions to all of these things out there, and some of them are pretty tricky. But always be aware of what I said earlier about don't be, be aware of your alternatives. The drone is not the right tool for every single job. All right, so I want to talk about corridor missions because that's something that's a lot more common than people that start doing, you know, two-acre, five-acre, even 20, 50-acre sites, then move to, okay, now i got five miles of a uh, corridor. How do I manage this? The first step is mission planning. Um, this one, thankfully, is a pretty easy one to solve uh, if you know what you're looking for. A lot of novice pilots that aren't familiar will just start, start drawing boxes and flying sites, you know, either zigzag back and forth, back and forth a thousand times. Um, thankfully, there are apps with, mit with linear mission planning capabilities. Uh, we have no strong preference on these. The one on the right is a uh, map pilot available on the app store for like 10 bucks. This is DJI's one that's based, that's baked into the Phantom 4 RTK. It has linear mission planning capabilities that automatically draws those parallel lines. Uh, when doing that, you do need a minimum, bare minimum of three flight lines. You cannot get away with two and expect good, good survey grade accuracy, it's just not reliable enough. And you sure as heck cannot fly a single flight line snapping photos over a linear asset and expect any sort of vertical accuracy that's worth anything at all. If all you need is a pretty picture, then sure, man, even then maybe one flight line is probably not enough. But uh, for good accuracy, good procedures on long corridor missions are a minimum of three flight lines, possibly a little bit more. So the next big problem with long corridor missions is flying within the visual line of sight. So anyone that's flown a big site knows that the drone, especially these tiny white phantoms, uh, you can't see them very far. And the FAA requirements say that you need to keep the drone within visual line of sight. So in real world situations, 1,500 feet is about as far as your eye can see in any direction. A little bit more if there's good lighting conditions, a little bit less with bad lighting conditions. Also depends on how recently you've seen the optometrist. My eyes are garbage, so I probably couldn't even see it at that. Uh, 2,000 feet linear if you want to kind of push your limits. So what this actually means when you're running a corridor mission with really anything, if you want to strictly follow the law, 4,000 feet is, the, is probably about the limit of a linear mission that you can fly from a single takeoff point. So as you're planning your mission, plan to fly about a 4,000 foot stretch, you just, you know, park your truck, fly a 4,000 foot stretch, it takes one battery usually, it takes, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, put it in, draw another, drive another 4,000 feet or so down, and do it again for as long as the project requires. It's a little bit of a pain, especially given that most of us know the technology is capable of doing more than that. You could set the drone and have it fly 10 miles away, you'd lose all, all signal, and then have it come back, and it would, and it would have good data. But that's uh, not particularly responsible legally, especially because if the drone ever didn't come back, you'd kind of be in trouble. Um, so our recommendation with that, with solving visual line of sight, is just plan to fly about three to 4,000 feet per block, and then pick up your drone and fly again another stretch of three, 4,000 feet. If you do that, you actually can knock out many, many, many miles in a single day. It's not, uh, it winds up not being that tedious, especially if you plan from the beginning to fly in those three to 4,000 foot blocks. And then the last question on uh, corridor emissions is actually that of GCP placement and distribution. So this is one that uh, we, we haven't published it yet, but we are drafting a white paper. We recently did a really, really in-depth corridor mission as a test. So we, what we did is we flew a project site. It was a linear mission. It was about four miles long, and we set hundreds of checkpoints. I think it was about 300 checkpoints, or a little bit more than that in some, or a higher density in some areas. And what we wanted to test was, what's the right pattern to set your GCPs? 
how far apart can you go with ground control before you actually start seeing a reduction in accuracy? What's enough control when you are flying linear missions with a drone? So our preliminary results are fly with a maximum of 1,000 feet between ground control points if you want a tenth of a foot vertical accuracy. And if you start going beyond 1,000 feet, that accuracy falls off quickly. If you go from 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet between your ground control points, accuracy uh, on the checkpoints is accuracy as measured by ASPRS positional accuracy standard. Uh, if you go from 1,000 feet between your control points to 1,500 feet, accuracy fell from a tenth of a foot vertical to about eight tenths of a foot vertical. It was a really, really sharp fall off from uh, 1,000 feet on. In fact, we, the fall off kind of started at 800 feet, so recommendation is probably about 750 is kind of your safe bet. Uh, a zigzag paddle where you actually set control points on the left, right, left, right uh, is recommended. That did turn out to be higher quality than setting it either um, in a straight line or even in pairs. Setting pairs takes a lot more time. It did not add any benefit to the final accuracy numbers. We do recommend pairs of ground control points at the end as well. Uh, a common thing in the photogrammetry processing stage for linear missions is depending on how your camera calibration settings are, are set, when you process photogrammetry on linear missions, the ends tend to peel up uh, just because of the way that the uh, camera is calibrated. And one way to help adjust for that is by making sure that you have more than just one GCP at the end of any of the uh, linear corridors. Um, also, setting pairs of control instead of just zigzag can help improve redundancy in the event that a ground control point is knocked out of commission for any uh, for any reason. I should also point out this this study was intentionally done with a non-RTK aircraft. Um, so yeah, overall, there are we what we've seen is there are three general uh, patterns that people set control points in for linear missions. We tested all of these. The first one is setting pairs together on either side of the road. The next one is zigzag, and then the third is linear. Linear definitely has a significant reduction in uh, accuracy. Yeah, question? Um, along this linear line, you said uh, using an app that is designed for linear uh, flight patterns. Did you, did you see, did you tell us what apps were? Yeah, so the, the two that we regularly use, there's one called Map Pilot for iOS, for Apple devices. Um, we are not affiliated with that company at all, but they make a great app. And the other one is going to be uh, the one that is built into the DJI RTK aircraft. It's called DJI like GSRTK. Both of those have linear mission planning capabilities, and both of those are ones that we uh, have used and are familiar with. There are additional apps out there with linear mission, cap mission planning capabilities. I'm just not intimately but you haven't seen that in like the PIX4D capture or... Yeah, PIX4D does not have it specifically. Now as far as these apps go, um, to be honest, from the photogrammetry processing side, they really don't make a huge difference when you use one app over the other. As far as your convenience, like that's really pilot's choice. If you like one over the other, great, keep using it. Um, they, they all produce, they all have a similar set of features with the exception, two big exceptions are going to be linear mission planning and also terrain awareness for sites with significant elevation change, the ability of the drone to actually mirror the, uh, the terrain. Uh, Map Pilot and DJI both also have those, which we, we like. Uh, so, Pix4D Capture is great for what it does, but it, it doesn't have some of the features that a lot of the other apps uh, have as well. So as far as these, uh, these patterns go, our, our research has shown that linear mission planning definitely can create a tendency for the project to twist kind of about that thing. If you imagine all of those on a single line, the data that are not, that's on the outside of that winds up getting a little wonky. The, uh, the vertical data can wind up twisting along that, that center line. So that's why the zigzag pattern or pairs is a little bit better. Um, I was actually quite surprised by the results that adding 
pairs for, for the same distance between here, if this were 500 feet and that were 500 feet, adding additional control points in pairs did not improve the accuracy of the final, uh, final survey relative to the zigzag pattern. That was a little surprising to me. Um, I had assumed that adding those pairs would prevent you know, any sort of data inaccuracy, but it was, uh, was really good. So generally speaking, that's kind of one of the, one of our, I mean, it's not even that specialized, but different from just a normal square workflow for linear mission planning. Um, we will be releasing that full white paper pretty soon, uh, within the next couple of weeks, once we get uh, a little bit more analysis done on all of that data. Any questions on linear missions? Or anyone have any particularly hairy issues that they're dealing with on, on linear pro projects that they want to ask about? All right. So next up, uh, the one that I want to talk about is flying in restricted airspace. This is another one that, uh, that can definitely catch people a little bit off guard, especially if they haven't done any mission planning, go out to a job site, and then their drone won't take off. And one thing that's often confused is the difference between FAA authorization zones and DJI no-fly zones. FAA no-fly zones are where the FAA says, hey, you can't fly here or you need approval to fly here. And DJI no-fly zones are the ones where they will geofence and lock down your aircraft so that you can't take off. These are not the same thing. DJI lets you fly without any sort of warning in a lot of areas where the FAA says you're not supposed to. Likewise, the FAA says you're perfectly clear to fly in some areas and DJI won't let you take off. Um, so just being aware that there are kind of two things that you need to check, DJI being the most tangible one for, uh, for users, because that's what will actually keep your aircraft from taking off. They have a couple of tricky things where they'll put no-fly zone around things like prisons, where actually the FAA doesn't care for a lot of these prisons and correctional facilities. But if you're within a half mile of any sort of correctional facility, uh, DJI won't let you take off, and you need to get, um, you need to unlock it before you take off. Now that's possible. They're online. Uh, it actually isn't that challenging to get DJI to unlock those. We've unlocked all of the most difficult one, uh, versions out there. Um, but it's just important to know the difference between FAA authorization and DJI. As far as FAA authorizations goes, um, the FAA, being a government bureaucracy, is extraordinarily particular about paperwork and precise terminology. So, there are three different types of things that most people will confuse and, uh, and mix up with one another in the real world, but as far as the FAA is concerned, are extremely different. There are the Lance airspace authorizations. These are the instant authorizations that most people have gotten their phones. There are manual or paper airspace authorizations. These are ones through which uh, the instant authorization is not available or you have chosen to go the paper route. Um, they take time, they are about a month, but they are more flexible. You can get FAA approval to fly nearly anywhere, including on airport property as necessary, which we've done before. They're actually approved under many circumstances and you can get them valid just standing authorizations for up to a year. But what most, most people confuse them with is waivers. And honestly, I don't care when people mix up terminology, but if you're ever going to apply to the FAA for any of these things, don't ask for a waiver when what you need is an authorization. A waiver sends you down a whole different bureaucratic paper trail that is way, way, way more problematic. A waiver is what you would want to get if you want to do something that is widely outside what is legal. If you want to strap your grandma to a chair and put eight drones on her and have her fly over to your, to your neighbor's house, you need a waiver for that. But if all you need is to fly close to an air airport, you do not need a waiver, you need an authorization. And even if the app says that it's zero foot and you can't get an on instant authorization, you still then want a manual authorization, not a waiver. The waivers, like I said, are a horrible, they're a miserable process. They are typically denied, and when they are denied, they are denied with no reason most of the time, other than saying, did not meet our safety criteria. That's all you get, and you just lost six months of your life. Question back there? You said the zero flight zone, those don't get the authorization like under the lands. You have to get the manual authorization? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So if you are in controlled airspace, and you pull up the app, 
and it says there is a ceiling of zero, um, then you cannot get Lance authorization at those zero foot ceiling areas. Your only op options are manual, or you could technically get a waiver. You wouldn't, they'd probably deny it. But uh, the, you, your option there is the manual airspace authorization, where you can actually uh, get that done. Typically takes a month turnaround time. You can expedite that if needed, um, but those are a little bit more tricky. And typically that's when you are working on airport property or extremely close to airport property uh, with the knowledge and consent of the airport operator uh, in order to get those, in order to get like a zero foot authorization. What app is this? I've been using like nautical charts and maps to figure out where my airspace is. Oh yeah, so this, I think the one in the screenshot is called Air Map. There's another one called Kitty Hawk that we really like. Um, those are both just airspace awareness ones. It'll let you file some of those into conversations. Both perfectly good apps, both work. Thank you. And the last thing that's worth noting kind of on the legal side is when you're flying drones in the real world, the FAA is looking for bad actors, not minor infractions. If you are flying and you cross accidently 100 feet into a 200-foot uh, ceiling zone while you're fly flying at 300 feet, the sirens are not going to come on. No one's going to chase you down. What they're looking for is people that are malicious actors, that are flying super, super close to major airports and disrupting air traffic. People that are harassing or disrupting uh, firefighters and other first responders. That's actually the biggest one is if there is, if there's a fire, do, don't fly your drone around there, especially wildfires. That'll get you in trouble. If there's police activity and you're not working directly with the police, don't fly your drone over the police officers. That's going to piss some people off and you're trouble for that. But if you uh, accidentally had your autopilot set wrong or your return home flight set wrong and you break through the ceiling and you fly up a little bit too high, don't panic. You are not going to get in trouble. But always the best idea is, or the best recommendation with this stuff is use your good judgment, be safe, and be responsible. Um, so wrapping it up all together and then I'll bring it back for just a couple of questions. Like I said, for, for us, the main goal is that if your drone program isn't saving you time and money, it's just not working. A drone is a tool, and you need to pick the right tool for the job. It's not applicable in all circumstances, and you can't force it to work when it doesn't, when it's the wrong tool for the job. And also, gear does not fix everything. It is very possible to spend a whole bunch of money, $100,000 plus, have a terrible workflow, and then get the whole drone program canceled because you spent so much money and it's costing you too much time on a single project. A better workflow is to use a more affordable drone, train key, one that is simple and reliable. Reliability is really like the key to all of this. And it's something I really need to stress more. I mean, better equipment is not better if it doesn't work. It's worthless. It's a $100,000 paperweight at that point. Better equipment is one that works every time you pull it out of the box and works exactly how you expect it. So a good workflow is one where you use a Phantom 4 or a Phantom 4 RTK. You fly your site, you shoot your ground control points, you get your data, you either do it yourself or you upload it to a company like us, where day two we'll get your photogrammetry done, we'll start the drafting, start delivering files, and you can get a whole survey done in three days for only a couple grand up front and saving a lot of time. And yes, like I said, we do offer a lot of this stuff. We do photo, professional photogrammetry, line work drafting. We sell ground control points and blah, blah, blah. We actually help get help our clients get FAA authorizations, uh, manual and otherwise, um, and help get all of your equipment to work so that when you're out in the field, it does work. But with that, I actually will uh, close off. First of all, I should say, um, if you want, drop your card off with me and I can give you a copy of the slide deck as well as a video of this presentation. Or you can just go to aerotoss.com slash UCLS and I will happily uh, email all of the information to you, um, including the video, the slide deck, and all of this information so that you can follow up with me. So, thank you very much for your time and attention.